Reeves, who is the co-founder and CEO of Marmoset Music in Portland. It's a boutique music agency crafting original music for story-driven creative in film, advertising, and television. In less than four years, Ryan has taken an idea between two guys in a coffee shop to a rocketing creative agency shepherding a vibrant conduit between Pacific Northwest independent music community and the global creative community. Marmoset's work has been featured in Super Bowl ads, viral brand campaigns, um, the Academy Awards, the Grammys, and award-winning films. In addition to leading the continually evolving strategy and direction of the business, he's the business guy, Ryan co-pilots Marmoset's creative teams and produces original music. Ryan is a 2001 graduate of Southern Oregon University. He majored not in music. <laughs> he majored in marketing with a minor in political science. So he's here to tell you about his journey and provide whatever advice he can to you as students here. Um, while he was here at SOU, he was quite active in student leadership. He worked as student manager in the student union and did a variety, held a variety of roles with um, student government. So he's happy to be back here in Ashland and relive his youth. Yes. <laughs> so come on up. Okay. Thank you for coming today. Thanks. Thanks. It's really fun being here. Uh, it's been walking through um, the campus a little bit this afternoon and uh, in town and reminiscing a little bit, it's calling a few of my old college friends and, and chatting them up about some stuff. So it's really great to be here. I want to make sure that um, this is more, uh, this can be a dialogue uh, conversation. Feel free to raise your hand at any moment, jump in, interrupt by all means. Um, I'd rather talk with you than at you. Um, we, have, we do have some time at the end. I'm going to plan to talk if I can for like 30-ish, 30, 30, 30-40 minutes and then we'll have some, some dedicated time for Q&A. So if you want to wait till the end, you certainly can. Um, I'm going to do this a little bit, a little bit backwards. I'm going to tell a little bit about my story, which will lead into what, what I do uh, as far as Marmoset and, and the business I have. And then um, uh, we'll see how we're doing on time. I may be able to share a little bit more of my, my ongoing vision with you as well. So um, we'll get started. Um, first of all, um, who here is from a small town? Just kind of curious. Um, okay. And who's, who's here from the, from the city? Big city? Okay. Wow. Wow. Um, so the small towns have it. I was born and raised in a uh, small town. Um, I'm, I'm born and raised Oregonian, um, Albany, Oregon. Um, anybody ever heard of Albany? Maybe. Uh, used to, we used to be able to say you could stop, you could, um, you would know because you would smell it on the freeway. <laughs> and then if you were from Albany, you're really defensive. You would say, no, that's Millersburg, which is the small town where the paper mill is at. Um, uh, this is what it's known for now, Heritage Mall, which is a terrible little, little mall that's uh, in town that I grew up walking around in. Um, and the Timber Carnival. They used to have this be famous for the uh, World Championship of Timber Sports, um, which was the uh, Timber Carnival. And uh, I don't know if it's still going or not, but um, uh, at one point I started a little record label called the Timber Carnival Records in ode to that. But uh, all that to say, I'm from a small town. Um, for better or worse, I feel like growing up it was great, but um, at some point it kind of felt small to me. Um, I don't want to be, be, be too condescending, but it kind of felt like a, a, a fishbowl at times. Uh, there weren't a lot of people leaving, a lot of people were staying there, and at some points I even felt like I was, I don't know, maybe looked down upon for kind of leaving and going away to school and then moving to the city eventually. I now live in Portland. Um, so it was, there, there were some challenges coming from that, from that small town um, atmosphere, and I think for me um, um, it was hard because uh, there weren't a lot of people that went off to big uh, universities, went off to big things. Most people stayed there, um, get, got a, 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 you know, a mill job or something like that, and not a lot of people left. I didn't even take um, SATs in high school. Um, I heard of some people taking them, but they seemed to be a few select smart people. Uh, certainly the whole school wasn't taking them. Um, really, just it was really odd when I look back on it now. Um, I've helped my younger brother and sister um, navigate that. They're much younger than me. and. Um, uh, and it was just kind of odd. So I, I went from, from high school, the natural progression in Albany was to go to Lindman Community College, which is the community college there, which is a, a fine school. Um, at one point, I, I followed a girl uh, t t to Ashland, um, a long, long distance relationship for a while. But that's how I ended up uh, discovering Ashland and coming to Southern Oregon U University. Um, I will say, coming from Albany, I, I was fortunate enough, I, I believe I was fortunate enough to have uh, some entrepreneurs in my family. My, both of my grandfathers were, were entrepreneurs. 
Um, I'm kind of curious, does anybody here, I know it's kind of early uh, being in school, but does anybody have any entrepreneurial uh, dreams or endeavors? Do you consider yourself maybe an aspiring entrepreneur? Or maybe you have dabbled in a little bit at this point. S show of hands, show of hands. Okay, and all, all business folks here, we have some other, other school, other uh, disciplines here as well. Okay, cool. Well, I didn't really know uh, what it meant to be an entrepreneur, I'd say, when I was um, at Southern uh, High School and College. I, I, I certainly did some things, uh, some, some paper routes, and uh, uh, um, man, had some, like, I had a baseball card company at one point that my grandfather let me put up in an empty, empty shop. I didn't really know what it was. Um, and I, I, if, if, if you are maybe where I was when I was at Southern, um, I, I, about this point, I started learning about what it meant to be an entrepreneur, and um, it was something that I, I couldn't really um, shake very easily. Um, I, I didn't really know what it meant. I knew it meant having a business, coming up with an idea, maybe managing people and leading people. Um, but it took me a while to kind of figure out what that was, and, and that's part of, of my journey. Um, leaving, uh, leaving Albany uh, and, and coming to, to Southern Oregon University was really, really big for me. Um, I, I say it was probably the most transformational time of my life. Um, I'm, I'm 39, so that gives you a little perspective there. I turned 39 yesterday. Um, um, and now I'm going to be 39 forever, I think. Um, so I, so coming to Ashland, for me, it was kind of hitting the reset button. It was discovering who I am outside of a small town. Um, I uh, felt that there was a, I quickly learned there was an ocean of opportunities here. Um, I explored different majors. I was a sociology major at one point. I was a psychology major at one point. I was a political science major at one point, and then switched to a minor. I kept feeling pulled, though, to the school of business, um, and um, uh, especially marketing um, was, was something uh, I really felt a, a strong pull to. So at some point, I just kind of gave up and went with it, um, and really felt at home, and really felt some, some little natural synergies there. Um, here at Southern, I, um, in addition to exploring different disciplines, I also explored different leadership opportunities um, on campus. I, I was a leader in the student union. There was a, um, a, something called the Games Room, which now I think is a defunct kind of nightclub down there. But at one point, there was a, kind of a, a recreational room down there where there was pool tables and, and games, and there was a, a, a um, kind of a nutritional organic store before all that was in. Uh, was, was kind of uh, popular, and there was a small staff of 15 people, and that's where I first learned um, about managing people, and working with people, leading people, um, was right there. I also was, uh, I, I was telling um, uh, uh, Sue uh, and Joan uh, earlier about um, all of the uh, other things I did on campus. I, I was an uh, events um, security guard um, for some events. I uh, worked uh, at football games and basketball games, um, <coughs> concessions. Um, I was in, uh, very involved in student government, started off as a senator in student government. Anybody here, student government people? Any student government? I say nerds, but they said it's not so nerdy anymore, maybe, I don't know. Um, <laughs> and I was uh, director of governmental affairs, where we lobbied uh, the state le legislature on trying to keep um, uh, tuition down and trying to keep students on the Oregon Health Plan and things like that. And then later I was the uh, director of uh, uh, administration of finance, so I was the student fee committee chairperson. Um, which uh, wouldn't have, there was a big, I think you're in a student fee uh, mm -hmm. uh, process right now, um, which, was, which was a lot of fun, and I, I gained a lot of experience from that. Um, more than anything, I'd say, uh, what happened for me when I came to Ashland was, was the friendships I made. Um, everybody, when I, so I'm a first generation graduate um, uh, post-secondary education, and when I came to Southern Oregon University, um, I, I didn't have a lot of friends that, that were in that mindset. When I arrived, I suddenly had um, made a lot of friendships where um, there were other, other students with, uh, whose families were like third and fourth ge generation um, graduates, which was really um, odd to me, really different to me. And I could just tell kind of a different approach, and maybe a different, something different kind of in the DNA and the way that they approached uh, school and leadership and opportunities. And it was really inspiring and invigorating for me. Um, I really felt like being in this environment um, caught on and really challenged me um, to the horizons and the different mountaintops that I looked to, to achieve. So that was really important. Those friendships are still lifelong friendships. Um, this is uh, a picture of a bunch of us. We got together uh, a couple of years after we all graduated and um, still, still very, very, very meaningful. Um, just going around there, there's uh, the guy in the front in the white shirt. He's a TA down in Orange County in the middle, uh, Betsy. Uh, and he was student body uh, president. Betsy, the, the woman behind him, it was student body president as well. Um, she's a, an attorney um, in Baltimore. We have a finance guy in the back. Um, who's uh, an auditor for uh, uh, private companies. Um, the, we have a computer science um, 
uh, guy in the beard um, who is uh, works for the fisheries in Alaska. And the guy in the front, uh, he works for the boardwalk down in uh, Santa Cruz. Is their main marketing and and uh, and sales guy. And then the guy on the left is the guy who's kind of an exception. Uh, he played football uh, and now he's a professional poker player. Um, he's been to the World Championships a few times, and I think uh, probably out earns all of us in that, uh, which, is, which, is, which is interesting. But uh, yeah, it's, uh, the, the relationships and the friendships that we've made here were really, really important to me um, and foundational um, in kind of establishing my confidence and my ability to, to uh, uh, dream. Um, when I left Southern, um, a, a couple of those friends I, I mentioned were, were lawyers, and a few others that weren't pictured were as well. And I kind of got on the boat too late. Um, they were already in the mindset of uh, preparing to go to law school next. And as they started going to law school, I found myself wondering, like, wow, that, I think that would have been very compelling for me. I wish I would have prepared for that too. Um, but I didn't. And it, you kind of have to know that a couple of years before, beforehand so you can start uh, studying and getting the right classes and things, requirements. Um, so for some reason, I felt my, uh, being a little bit bummed that I didn't prepare for law school. Um, it was something I kind of wish I would have done. Um, later on, um, I would encourage my wife um, who was a wonderful student uh, to pursue law school, and I kind of did it vicariously through her. Uh, she had kind of half half blames me for that now. Um, but um, so I was, I, I was a little bit bummed, and then I, I also um, uh, wanted to, of course, uh, I wanted to move to the city, uh, which is a dream of mine. I've never been in a big city, so I wanted to go to Portland or San Francisco, and I chose Portland um, to explore opportunities there. Um, it was hard at that point. Um, I, I was I left Southern, left my friends, and. Uh, was, was just trying to find my footing. Um, I thought um, coming from a, a business degree and having some experience in leadership um, and having some specialties in marketing that I'd be able to kind of get my, my foothold pretty quickly and, and start that career path. But it, it wasn't as easy, as, easy as, as I thought it would be. My first job uh, was working for a, a bank. There was a grocery store bank. Um, I did not enjoy that very much, walking through the aisles of a grocery store trying to sell loan uh, products and things uh, and checking accounts. To, uh, to people who were there to buy groceries. Um, I think I worked there for about four or five months was how long I lasted. Um, for me, at least, it was some, some initial uh, opportunity, some initial income, and it actually helped me, uh, was a stepping stone to get up to Portland. I also met, met my wife there. She worked there uh, even, even less than I did. I think she was there for two or three months. Uh, an important um, role, but I didn't enjoy it. So I, I moved to Portland. I worked for a company called the Standard Insurance Company. It's a disability benefits analyst. Um, th that kind of job. Uh, it's kind of like it sounds. It's a disability benefits analyst. It wasn't what I wanted to do. I wanted to be doing marketing, but it was it was a good job with good benefits. A big company that they employed 2,000 people downtown Portland. It was really um, uh, um, kind of a fun, exciting opportunity in the beginning. And my approach was I thought maybe I would go on the operations side, and then when an opportunity presented itself in the marketing uh, uh, or PR side, that I could uh, make that maneuver. Um, eventually, I actually uh, working for the Standard Insurance Company. Um, I actually had a little too much fun, uh, full, full disclosure, uh, coming clean here, um, I was a little bit of a, of, a, of a prankster, a funny guy back then, and so me and a couple friends would play pranks on each other, at one point I caught up with this, and uh, it, it essentially led, led to my exit uh, there, which, which uh, was, was very frustrating, it was a super conservative env environment, um, I mean you couldn't wear jeans to work, uh, um, ever and uh, they wanted you to wear a tie sometimes and it was it was really stuffy coming from college and trying to make that transition there was some some hard lessons too learning about how to how to kind of be mature in the workplace and grow up but also left me scratching my head thinking come on you should be able to have a little bit of fun in the workplace so it was a learning experience moving forward I, I went from kind of uh, a job I worked at a job for a year or two and then go to another job um, uh, I worked for a manufacturing company where we put um, uh, cranes um, on offshore oil rigs and, and um, uh, aircraft carriers, uh, working on big contracts with the military um, and building uh, forestry equipment. It was really kind of an odd, odd place to be, but I was their uh, marketing manager and PR person. Um, it was a, a wonderful opportunity. Um, I really uh, learned a lot. Uh, they were out in Sherwood. They are called Allied Systems Company. Worked there for about two and a half, three years, and then I went to work for a nonprofit called Schoolhouse Supplies in Portland, um, which was, a, um, I was the development director, so basically leading all their fundraising efforts. Um, I did that for about a year and a half, and I had a, uh, a boss that um, was really challenging for me to work with. Her previous role uh, was my role as the development director, and then she was uh, promoted to the executive uh, director. And a um, uh, very, very nice woman, um, but it, it was hard because I think she had just done my job and kind of had her mindset how she wanted to do it. And so it was frustrating trying to meet those expectations when I wanted to do it my way and be myself. 
And so, um, again, I found myself challenged in a role where I wasn't, um, you know, I went in really excited, and after about a year or two, um, I uh, just kind of scratched my head and frustrated, um, wishing that um, I could find something I could really have some long, long-term passion for. Um, I went on from there to work for an advertising a agency called R2C Group in Portland. Um, really started to blossom there as a, as a professional. Uh, um, it took me, at this point, we're talking probably like six years, uh, five or six years to reach that point. Um, and I, I was really getting frustrated uh, career-wise, thinking like, wow, I know I've got this talent, I know I've got some skills, I know I've got something to, to give, but it was taking me a lot longer to get there than I had hoped. Um, so I went to this advertising agency and um, was their uh, marketing manager, uh, basically the digital uh, marketing and PR manager. So they do advertising for a lot of clients, um, but I was the person internally doing basically all the, all the marketing and, and, and uh, advertising for the agency itself. So it was a really interesting role. I got to um, work directly with the, um, uh, with the founder and CEO and the management team. Uh, now this is a company at that point that was doing about $250 million a year um, in, in business, which is huge. I think they're the second biggest ad agency in Portland, uh, second to White and Kennedy at the time, really under the radar as far as an agency because they weren't doing the big, awesome, and crazy creative work that White and Kennedy was doing, uh, much more uh, conservative and actually uh, d uh, dabbling some in long form, which is common in those like, infomercial stuff. So, um, so it's not the most sexiest of advertising, but they were doing a lot of it, doing re really good work. So I really started to blossom there. And at that point, um, I uh, kind of decided that um, kind of I, I wanted to uh, start taking matters in my own hands as to reach my passions. And so I had some friends that had bands, um, and my, my, my friends that had, had bands, um, I'm not a musician, mind you, they, they saw me as this, this marketing guy, marketing and PR are the two things I did, and they wanted to help. Uh, they want to help getting their name out there. They want to help um, getting exposure, getting booked at, at, at clubs, planning tours. And so I very naturally just started doing that for them. And in that, I really started finding my passion. Now, I didn't find any monetary reward in that. Um, and it was actually a lot of work, a lot of late nights. Fortunately, as my, as my wife was going to law school, uh, she was very caught up in all of her homework uh, and all of her uh, uh, school endeavors. So I had a lot of free time on my hands, so I just immersed myself in this new thing that I became very passionate about. Um, and I, I think the key moment for me uh, in that was um, I, I decided I wasn't going to play the game anymore. I wasn't going to go from job to job to job and keep trying to find my way in someone else's place. Now, so, some people can do that and, and succeed quite well. And I'm sure if I was in a different scenario, one of those uh, opportunities, I could have found my way and really enjoyed it. But for me, I didn't. And so I decided to take matters in my own hands and really start um, kind of making something happen um, where there wasn't previously uh, an outlet for me in that way. Um, so I started working for a band. A band hired me called the Dandy Warhols. Maybe yeah, you've heard of them. Uh, anybody heard of the Dandy Warhols in the room? Okay, they're they're kind of big world world worldwide uh, band. They're actually, really big in Europe and tour a lot. They hired me to be their uh, label manager and their director of, of, of like digital strategy. So um, I, I did that for about uh, two years, and very quickly and. I, l I was going to leave the ad agency to do that, and the ad agency said, please don't go. So somehow I worked it out where I worked two days a week at the ad agency, two days a week at, uh, for the Dandy Warhols, and actually had a day a week to myself, which is where I started to kind of figure out my, my next thing. Um, so all of that to say, all those experiences really helped form um, my next step, and that was starting my own business. My own business uh, is called Marmoset. Um, and uh, Marmoset is uh, basically me, me trying to figure out, with my passion in the music business and working with these independent bands and artists, figuring out how do these smaller independent bands and artists make a living um, uh, doing what they enjoy, following their passion, music, and how do, they, um, how do they make that sustainable? How do they maybe leave their day jobs and do music full time? So I really started thinking on that and trying to come up with ways. Um, to do that. I started a record label, I started my own PR company in my side time previously and that happened, that kind of just pushed that along a little bit in my free time for a couple of years and then I started Marmoset. Marmoset was uh, a mutual friend, um, or a friend of a friend and I, basically uh, getting together and he knew a little bit and I knew a little bit and we decided we were going to give this a try. So um, I and my very small uh, North, North Portland cottage um, at my dining room table, worked from there, and quickly got a couple of interns. My business partner is really the kind of creative, the emotional, uh, spiritual, uh, kind of sometimes on a different plan, this sort of creative, who had experience in scoring music. He's a musician, graduate of the University of Oregon uh, School of Music. Um, and then I was basically the, the, uh, the business person, but also um, in the music uh, industry, there's, or at least in our business, there's 
half of it is scoring music to pictures that's making original music uh, for uh, film and TV and commercials, and the other half is uh, using existing music that bands put out on records and things and finding placement for that in uh, commercials and, and television shows and films. So I focused on that side and he focused on the scoring side. We got together, we each put $200 into uh, a bank account and started. We didn't, we've never taken on any debt, we just put this thing together and started. Um, so that was in 2010. Um, fast forward uh, to today, we have nearly 25 uh, people. We took it from that $200 uh, it, it, uh, endeavor in the bank account, and now it's a multi-million dollar company. It's, it's been um, really fascinating to see the fast growth of it. Sometimes it kind of scares me a little bit, um, to be honest. Um, but to explain to you kind of what, what we do at Marmoset, um, we're an off, uh, the, way, the way we describe it is we're an off the beaten path, uh, full service, um, uh, boutique music agency. So any uh, uh, creative agency, advertising agency, filmmaking company, production company, um, uh, anybody that needs music to put to picture, basically, or any other creative endeavor that would use music, um, we, we provide that. Um, our, our kind of niche, if you will, is uh, something that's called indie music, which is also very vague at the same time of being a descriptor. So, but um, if you know, if you think of any no Pacific Northwest based bands, and that kind of aesthetic, the kind of rough around the edges, uh, um, a little bit uh, lo-fi, not quite super polished, not LA sounding, but, but more uh, earnest, more um, authentic, more um, endearing. That, that kind of music is, is what we do. Um, let's see, uh, um, we, we've had, as, as it was described, we've had some things placed. Our very first job out of the gate was, was a, a Bud Light Super Bowl uh, campaign that debuted during the Super Bowls. Um, Let's see. Um, what I'm going to do to kind of be better paint that picture, this is a, a picture of our, of our space, um, of our, our team um, uh, sitting around and discussing music. Um, to give you a better idea of what we do, I'm just going to show you our reel that we, that we show to clients qu quite frequently. Um, so you get a better impression of the kind of uh, work we do and the kind of music we sound like and kind of our unique approach to it. I think you'll, you'll understand a little bit uh, in this. Oops. How do you go back? A man in Montana bought a house in the country. And it's true love, baby. Now we're sprinkling not just one, but two layers of delicious cheese and adding your favorite toppings all the way to the edge.
two, il y a encore un os dans le lab. And calm down, everyone. Calm down and stand back. I'm almost finished. That's Brandon. <laughs> He's our uh, artist relations uh, guy and, and new music scout. He has a pretty cool job. Um, he has to help bring in the, the music to the roster uh, for us. Um, that was actually shot on Sabi Island, uh, mm -hmm. which is near uh, just north of Portland. Um, he actually did go out into the water a few times and come back out. It's kind of a, I don't know if it's a great place to go into the water. It's the, it's the convergence of the Willamette and uh, Columbia River, so there's probably some good uh, agricultural chemicals in there. But he, he was a good sport. Um, uh, just got me kind of kind of thinking for a moment, um, based on the conversation we were having right before we started about analytics. Um, when I say Brandon's job is the uh, um, uh, artist relations and new music scout, I, I don't know what kind of impressions you have as far as how he finds music in bands and things like that. But it's really very data driven, very analytics driven. Um, he's constantly looking at what kind of music is licensing from our catalog uh, and seeing what works and what doesn't work. Um, He's uh, constantly uh, talking to our creatives and asking what kind of um, uh, requests they're getting from their clients for, for different kinds of music. And he's constantly correlating all of that data and trying to figure out how to optimize our catalog. We don't want to have a lot of artists and a lot of musicians in our catalog that aren't a good fit and aren't licensing. And so if we have somebody for, say, six or 12 months that um, aren't licensing, maybe we thought they would, but we were wrong, uh, it's okay to admit you were wrong once in a while. We have a conversation with them where we let them know, hey, this, is, this isn't working out quite like we thought it was, and we think you'd be better served to you know, uh, you, you know, have somebody else represent your music. Um, that way they're not expecting that we're going to find opportunities for them, and we don't feel like all of the weight is on our shoulders uh, as well. Um, one thing I'm really proud about Brandon is from using the data and analytics and constantly crunching numbers and reviewing our catalog, uh, we currently, He's been able to have a very high success rate in our catalog. So we currently have, uh, represent about 450 artists, which may sound like a lot, but to a lot, a lot of music uh, licensing agencies, there's a lot of huge ones out there um, that have uh, tens of thousands, 20,000 or more, 50,000 artists on their roster. So 450 is actually really small. Um, last I checked, for our last six months look back, um, I believe about 67% of our, of our catalog, those artists, have uh, had a license with us. Um, and many of them multiple licenses. So um, he's having a really high, making a really high efficiency rate of our catalog. And again, that's uh, if you hear you know a lot of your statistics, statistics class or analytics class, like those things really can can um, um, can make a big difference um, when you're when you're looking at a business like this. Um, another thing I want I want to show you, I just showed you a reel. Hopefully that gave you a, a good idea of what we do. We also have a, a, a web-based music licensing platform. Um, so we, we work with a lot of clients directly. Um, uh, I like to say that Portland's a little bit of an island. We're kind of stuck up in the Pacific Northwest, and we're not a major market. So we actually have to get on airplanes and get out to the major markets a lot. Um, uh, our clients are global. Uh, most of it's domestic. I'd say probably 80 or 90 percent of it is within the United States. Um, but of, uh, within the United States, I'd say uh, the major, our biggest markets are San Francisco, New York, Chicago. Uh, Portland is probably four or five. Seattle's in there as well. Um, and then there's uh, some, a bunch of other cities too. So we have to get out from the Pacific Northwest and really kind of, we kind of think of ourselves as ambassadors because um, uh, we represent you know, the Pacific Northwest. We represent um, Oregon and Portland. If you, you, know, you watch our reel, if you explore any of our branding materials or our website, we really resonate with that Pacific Northwest brand. And um, what's been really fascinating is going out to New York and even going to San Francisco, you go to these places and say you're from Portland, Oregon, or say you're from Oregon, uh, and, and say music or indie music in the same sentence and people stop and will listen and will want to talk to you. They'll invite you in. It's really fascinating. There's a lot of cachet in the Pacific Northwest and in that brand right now. Uh, it really, really, that story really follows well 
um, out to the uh, outer, outer reaches of the, the country and beyond. So it's, I don't know if it's just good timing, I don't know if it's because of shows like Portlandia or, or what exactly it is, but it's a lot of fun. Um, when we go to these global ad agencies, uh, like, like Gray in New York and, and McGarry and McCann, these big ones that you, if you watch Mad Men, you'll hear their names th th thrown around. Um, you know, we, we don't go in, you know, all dressed up. We go in dressed like this or maybe, maybe even intentionally wear plaid and grow out our beards a little bit. And it's a little kitschy, but we walk in and they'll know, like, hey, you're the guys from Portland, aren't you? And, and uh, we just kind of go with it. Um, and it's, it's not being contrived, it's just kind of being who we are and not having to try to adapt to you know, New York or Chicago. And it's, it's actually been a lot of fun. Um, with that Pacific Northwest vibe, we've been able to do a lot of really fa uh, fascinating work. Whether that, I'm gonna show you um, uh, a piece from a campaign we did um, working with White and Kennedy in Portland. Um, the uh, uh, Oregon uh, Travel Bureau went to them and said we need help uh, with, our, with our brand, with the campaign. And um, travel bureaus typically don't have big budgets and a lot of money. Um, but uh, Wyden Kinney took them on as, a, uh, as kind of a passion project. Uh, Dan Wyden actually uh, played uh, creative director on the project or executive creative director on the project. It's kind of a pet project of his. It was a really fun project to work on. They did uh, something that they called the Seven Wonders of Oregon. They had a, a different uh, commercial for each one of these seven wonders. And then they had a kind of an anthem spot, which I'll show you. Um, they came to us and wanted to make, uh, wanted to make sure the music was, was very much intertwined with, uh, with the brand. Um, and so we uh, kind of scoured different bands uh, based in, in, in uh, Oregon, and we ended up coming uh, down to this band uh, that used to be on Sub Pop um, called the Fruit Bats. And uh, the, the head person of the Fruit Bats, uh, that head singer-songwriter, um, scores films from time to time, so we got him to work on this with his band. Uh, one, of their band one of his bandmates is actually one of our music supervisors on our team. And so we worked closely with them to score each and every spot. Um, I'll show you uh, one of these, uh, just because it's kind of a fun one to look at. It's one of my favorite uh, pieces of work that we've done. Mount Hood was left off the list. So was the Oregon coast. The Columbia River Gorge was somehow overlooked, as were the Painted Hills. Smith Rock and the Wallawas are both missing from it. All we can figure is whoever named the Seven Wonders of the World never set foot in Oregon. Because even Crater Lake was left off their list. So we see your wonders world and raise you seven of our own. And we invite you to come experience them. Our wonders aren't just for looking at. You have to explore them, feel them beneath your feet. Just remember, this is Oregon. So how you go about doing that is entirely up to you. The Seven Wonders of Oregon. See one, or better yet, see them all. So obviously that was a lot of fun to work, work on. Um, so as I was telling you earlier, we score music, custom the picture, which is part of what we do. Another part of, part of what we do is we use this catalog of artists, of their existing material, and we work with creatives and agencies and, and production companies to find the right song for the project they're working on. Um, that act of finding, helping somebody find the right song for what their project they're working on is commonly referred to as music supervision. Has anybody here ever heard of music supervision before? Raise your hand, maybe, if you have. It's a really weird word, because it's weird to think of you're supervising music. But if you, uh, if you look at uh, the, the credits after a film you watch, maybe even after a television show, uh, you'll almost always see a credit music to a music supervisor. And that person basically works with the creatives involved with the film, the producers and the directors and the writers, to find the right music to help tell the story of whatever's happening on screen. Um, in the picture. And so we currently have a staff of five music supervisors and that's their job all day is basically work with creatives who are working with, with motion picture to help them find the right song to go with their, um, with their project. Um, it's, a, it's a ton of fun to do that. Um, early on I did a lot, of that, a lot of that myself and to help connect those dots a little bit more for you I have this little uh, uh, case study um, that will kind of help show you what this is like. So um, last year around uh, holiday time, uh, I took our team out to uh, actually a Christmas tree farm on Sabi Island and uh, we went as a team to cut down a Christmas tree, um, bring it back to the studio and put it up. It was a lot of fun, a little team, team building endeavor. Um, I, told, I knew we were going to have it uh, take some pictures and, and then uh, someone else decided they'd bring a video camera, somebody who was really good with vi a video by the way. And when I knew that was happening, I told everybody, everybody wear plaid and wear a scarf and wear jeans and let's really uh, play this up. And so they got to this really awesome footage of us uh, getting this Christmas tree. I'm going to show you the slow motion version of us carrying it out. Um, 
Well, that's not the point. The point of what I want to show you here is uh, I've got five or I think five different cuts of the same footage that we put different pieces of music to. I asked my music supervision team to give me some really good cuts. They actually gave me like 12 or 15, and I just narrowed it down to the best five or six. So I'm going to show you uh, the, the, the impact and the difference music can make. I mean, you think about this. Think about it globally. Think about it from a branding standpoint, from an advertising standpoint, from a storytelling standpoint, if you're trying to tell a story. And then also think about the emotions that you hear when you see the music um, and its, its relationship to what's going on in the picture. Um, I think it's a, it's a very much an emotional experience anytime you put music with picture. We're always trying to find the right experience, the right uh, intersection of music and picture to put off the right vibes, the right emotion, to tell the story that the, that the creator has in mind. So um, I've got about five of these I'm going to show you, and uh, this should be a little bit fun. So there's one, sit with that for a sec, and then we'll do the next one. All right, that's a little uh, peek behind the curtain of what we, part, part of what we do. Um, moving uh, forward, we're uh, kind of getting um, kind of low on time. So what I'd like to do, rather than get into a lot of other stuff, I, I gave a, a, a TED talk, uh, a, t a TEDx talk uh, back in May, um, kind of about my, uh, my vision for um, uh, leading people. This is this creative stuff is very is very uh, exciting. The creative aspects of what we do in the, in, in the business. A lot of very talented people uh, that do that. Um, but I, I tend to uh, more and more as we mature as a company. I tend to I've been pulling back more from that as we have great people that can step in and do it. I've been focusing more on kind of the the business part of it and the people part of it. And what what motivates people? What inspires people? And um, I gave a talk about uh, uh, what I think works and what doesn't work. 
Um, and I think that there's a lot of, uh, especially in the creative industry, uh, which in the business world, there's a lot of aspects that can kind of lean creative, but uh, it kind of uh, translates globally. The amount of uh, time people work, um, the uh, kind of expectations in the workplace, um, uh, people working crazy hours, uh, 10, 10 hours a day, 12 hours a day, um, uh, it can be it can be really, really crazy. And I think um, the more, in a nutshell, the more we can uh, focus on the people and less on the processes and with the bottom line, but focus on the people and the needs of the people, um, figuring out what people need to be healthy, to be good, to be at their best, and, and then being able to support them in that, um, you can really drive better results. I think overall as a company, we can take more of a macro uh, uh, view of the company and a micro view on the, on the people. So uh, if you want to take, take some time to go and, and check that out, um, you can find it by just Googling my name and, and, and TEDx, and I think you can get that too. But to save us time, I won't get into all that stuff, um, but rather just like to open this up um, and see if anybody has any questions, want to hear about any experiences. Um, I can tell you more about the company, the different roles in the company. Uh, we have internship programs. Um, we have a, we um, have a very, very young workforce. Almost everybody on our workforce started uh, out of college and uh, came on board and have learned their role and have really blossomed into their careers um, on the job. Um, almost nobody came in in a really senior role, um, which is something that really, really, yeah, has been very exciting, exciting to me. Um, so yeah, if you have any questions, we'd love to just kind of chat about something. Sure. Why Marmoset? Is that like Music Monkeys? That's a great name. Uh, it's a great question. Um, uh, it's just kind of a random name. Um, this, this is this is how, how, how nerdy I I am or, or can be. Is uh, back when we, we came up with that, I was trying to think of a fun name, a creative name. Um, but actually, uh, the nerd part is I was trying to think of a name that would play well uh, from a search standpoint and uh, SEO standpoint, if you will. So there wasn't anything in the Marmoset uh, kind of space. There was, if you Googled Marmoset or Marmoset Music, there was nothing there, and there still isn't very much. I think a band called Marmoset popped up since then, um, but it was uh, it was a kind of fun, creative, furry animal that uh, t tends to thrive in a, like a very familial community as a cute animal. I've actually seen pictures of them like holding on to somebody's finger, like that tall, okay. the pygmy marmosets. Um, so it was a cute name, and it played well uh, from a search standpoint. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, when you first started your business, were there any major setbacks that you faced? And if you did, how did you? Okay. Yeah, the the biggest I'd say the biggest major setback for us um, was uh, getting the word out. Kind of that Portland being an island, and and we had never done what we had done before. Um, the way that we started our company. Uh, there's nobody that has a company that quite offers what we do and the way we do it. People have different aspects of it, but we kind of. Um, uh, naively in some ways, kind of said, we're not going to look at what everybody else is doing. We're going to start something from scratch and go at it our own way, kind of pioneer something, knowing that we'll make some mistakes, knowing that we might put some people off at times, and as long as we're able to apologize and kind of adjust, I always kind of went at it that way. And so um, nobody knew who we were, uh, so it was a lot of, uh, the hard part was uh, exposure. So, um, you know, cold calling, uh, you know, ad agencies in New York and Chicago and sending a lot of cold emails. Um, Anytime anybody showed any interest in the very beginning, like the slightest interest, um, we would uh, put together a packet of uh, um, like this compelling little booklet that told our story and um, uh, kind of a, a, a real kind of deep, uh, like, like I showed earlier of, what, of, the, of our work. Um, we'd include a CD of some music back in the early days. We don't do CDs anymore. And we would send it out to them. Um, sometimes we would even send uh, a bottle of uh, an Oregon microbrew or a bag of Stumptown coffee, a little piece of Oregon or Portland to send out into the world. And um, it's kind of that, that thing I talked about earlier, the, the saying Portland and music or the Pacific Northwest and music in the same sentence, for some reason, I would get people's attention. I think we're, we're partially lucky in that. Um, and it's music, so it's if you are working at an ad agency, if you're working at a production company and you have different vendors and people uh, pitching you all the time, it can get, it can get probably tiring as it is in any, in any job or any profession. But I think when it's music, it's a li it can be a little disarming for some people because it is music, it's emotional, it's interesting. It can be a break from whatever you're working on. And so, uh, but getting the word out, it was, it was hard. I mean, we, turned into, we were like a mailing factory for a while, just mailing out. Um, I mean, sometimes I say the secret to our success is mailing out beer and coffee to everybody all over the, all over the world. Um, we got us in trouble with the USPS Postmaster at one point uh, when we started using UPS. And they don't tend to uh, get too, too uh, um, perturbed about shipping beer. I mean, they don't ask as many questions either. But. <laughs> yeah? Do you outsource any uh, parts of the business? Do you outsource any parts of the business? Um, not really. No, um, I have, a, I have a, a, a business affairs manager and a, a financial affairs manager. Um, 
that, uh, again, he wasn't in a senior role. He had done a little bit of that before and has really grown in his role at Marmoset. Um, because of that, I have kind of a, a kind of a, what do you, I call it almost, almost like a, a freelance or a contract uh, CFO, if you will. Somebody uh, uh, who is a, as an MBA and is from a, um, a, a, a financial company that kind of does this for small companies. So they, we, every, every month when we wrap up our books, we ship them uh, to this company, to this guy. He goes through everything and puts together these uh, various different reports and dashboards. I think I have probably like 30 different tabs because I've asked for so many different uh, reporting data for our business, different models, uh, so we can kind of try to project how we're going to be doing. And that person is our only external person. So then we have a, a one-hour call once a month. He's actually, of all places, in, uh, is in Alabama. We have a one-hour call each month. We go over everything. He uh, talks us through the different parts of our dashboard and our forecasting and our modeling. And for me, it's a, an extra step of uh, assurance and confidence and uh, knowledge and wisdom in what we're doing. Um, but that's the only aspect that we, uh, that we outsource. Great question. Yeah. Uh, in your TED Talk and now you've uh, referenced the, uh, the people that you deal with as creatives. Uh -huh. uh, can you explain why you talk to them or they're creatives to you? Yeah, yeah. The, so uh, the people uh, that you're talking about, the creatives, where we get, here we go. Uh, this is how, how, how I define it. Um, um, someone who makes or invents or grows new things or ideas, exhibiting varying degrees of imagination, sensitivity, and complexity, um, and that, that the word I like to focus on is the complexity, because in creatives, no matter what they're making or creating or doing, um, that that something special uh, that that allows them to create or helps them um, um, come up with ideas and helps them uh, form or craft whatever they're working on. There's something in there that I don't know if it's spiritual or emotional or uh, you know what it is. It's part of their ethos uh, that they that they have, but it's complex and it's different for each person. And so, um, uh, when working with creatives, so in my business, as a business person, I'm a business person first, creative person second. Uh, so I kind of, I, I walk the line on type A, type B, which not a lot of people do that I've found. More people are in one camp or the other, but there are a few of us kind of in the middle. Um, it's both a good thing to be in the middle, it's also a bad thing to be in the middle. Uh, but um, uh, in that, um, uh, in dealing with creatives, uh, you just have to kind of, I think, approach them in a, from a, a different way. That creatives are not the type that are going to be um, uh, inclined to want to be factory workers. They're not inclined to want to be um, having a, a high, working in a high-stress environment um, or working under a lot of duress or uh, be, be given orders you know, on a regular basis. They like to be able to have, uh, um, uh, I would just say that they need, they require a higher degree of care and attention and uh, a higher degree of, I think that it's, if there's a, Kind of a, it's like nuance in how you would approach leading them. Um, I had a, a friend who was a guitar player in a band once uh, who described it to me this way. He said, uh, you know how you, uh, when you pet a cat a certain way, it purrs? But have you ever tried petting the cat the other way? <laughs> um, approaching creators is kind of that way sometimes. Like, like you kind of have to know what makes them purr in order to be able to get kind of the, the results or the output or the creation that you're, you're wanting to lead them toward. And if you aren't able to kind of get them to purr, you're going to have a hard time. And um, that's, I don't know if that answered your question, but it's, what's, it's the kind of thing that I'm thinking about a lot, is since I would say are, are definitely in the creative camp. Yeah. What sort of jobs do your interns do? Uh, yeah, uh, so we typically, any given time, we'll have two or three interns. Um, uh, we had a uh, financial affairs intern recently, um, who actually was uh, as a student at Florida State. Um, he reached out to us, super enthusiastic, and um, wanted to fly all the way up from Portland State, uh, sorry, from Florida State, so we, we uh, invited him, and he was outstanding, um, keeping in touch with him, uh, hoping that he might consider Portland after he graduates. Um, most of our interns work with uh, Brandon, the, the young man who was coming out of the water uh, at uh, Sabi Island, and they work with him to uh, help initially with art artist relations, so uh, there's a lot of correspondence that goes with, with artists um, to uh, make sure that they have all the information they need, there's contracts involved, um, there's agreements that have to be signed, there are all these materials that we need from them, we need their music, we need them in high, high what's called high res format um, um, of the music, we need uh, media files, we need bios, we need information, and then af as they get paid, um, they have a lot of questions and there's a lot of uh, care that goes, again, talking to the complexity of, of, of creatives, there's a lot of care that goes into um, all these relationships we have with, with these artists. And so uh, the interns get kind of to be on the front lines and help, help us navigate those, um, which is kind of, as my, from my opinion, is kind of in the, in the trenches or on the front lines. Um, it's a great way, it's a great kind of immersion uh, into our business, but it's also 
uh, working on communication, working on legal aspects, working on creative aspects, working on asset management. Um, there's also uh, a process of what we do that actually requires listening to music and being able to understand what instruments uh, you're hearing, what the arc of the song uh, or track may be, um, what genre it may be, different things like that. And so we, we train the interns to kind of understand some of those those more uh, music specific things so that they, when they we intake new music, we can identify what those are and kind of tag that music. Um, occasionally they'll sit in on our, our creative meetings and creative calls. Occasionally they'll sit in on our marketing meetings and marketing calls. Um, all different things like that. In the back. Yeah. Uh, what would you say uh, your proudest achievement since you started the company? And if you can talk more about uh, some of the great experiences you have. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, so, proudest achievement is um, being in business for four years and have never had anybody quit. Um, we uh, sh uh, share in our in our uh, studio building. Um, it's, a, it's a wonderful place. If you're ever in Portland, I invite you. Uh, um, as a Southern alum, I invite you as uh, kind of kin, if you will. Please uh, reach out and come to our space. We'll give you a tour and make you a cup of coffee. If you're old enough, maybe even serve you a beer. Um, <laughs> but uh, but um, uh, we share a space with a, create, with a, a film production company. Um, and we lost one person to them. He was like, man, I love being here, but I really want to explore film production more. And so he went over there. But technically, in four years, no, no one has ever quit. Um, and it's really, really exciting to me um, uh, knowing that... Uh, in the creative world especially, it's high turnover, uh, about 30% turnover rate in the creative industry. Uh, so about once every three, uh, if you work at a creative company, every three years people are turning over. Um, and if you look at uh, big, big companies, um, big creative companies like say at Google or an Amazon, the annual turnover rate at, uh, or the, I'd say the average tenure of an employee at Google and Amazon is only one year, which is really fascinating to me. Apple is only two years, it's fascinating to me. Uh, and then uh, uh, McDonald's. Um, it's actually three years, so that's a head scratcher for me. <laughs> <laughs> so at this point, four years in, I like to say we're beating McDonald's. Uh, beating McDonald's. But I mean, that's that's what I'm proud of is we have a team um, of people that it's much more familial, and it's easy to do when you're smaller. I mean, we're uh, pushing up against 25 people. Um, so we're at, we're at this place where we're really trying to keep it small. We're trying to lean into uh, systems and processes, uh, technology to be more efficient and be able to keep a small familial vibe um, at the company. Um, but there's just a high degree of passion in our company. People show up invigorated. People show up um, really excited about what they do. Um, I mean, even the last quarter was a record quarter for us. The last month was a record month for us. The last year was a record year for us. So we just keep doing this, and um, I can't help but attribute it to the people we have um, that are there and the, pa the degree of passion they have and the degree of care that I think um, myself and the other leaders on our team have for those people. So that's what I'm most, that's my proudest moment is, it, is, it, is all of that. Now, what's been most exciting to me is just, I mean, being able to have this kind of sandbox of a business that I can just kind of tinker in and, and tweak and try different ideas out and experiment and, and look at the results. Um, I've also really enjoyed coming from a small town, being able to travel a lot, go, being able to go to New York, go to Chicago, go to San Francisco, and not just visit these cities, but be able to go to these cities and go into some of the most creative, most successful uh, companies and agencies and organizations out there and invite us in and be able to meet some of the top creatives in the world. Um, and, and meet with them and see what the insides of their organizations look like and um, get to hear the way they approach creative things. Um, and, and because it's business, you get to travel on business tabs. We get to go out to nice dinners and go out to have good happy hours with these folks. And it really is a lot of fun, um, for sure. You're such a high emotionally connected business. Yeah. What's been the most harrowing experience with a prospective client? How did you handle it? What did you learn from it? Harrowing experience, like up, up against like uh, something tragic and, and surviving. Um, could be, or it could be uh, it was horrifying or scary. Or, uh, glad you got it. Glad we didn't get that one. Or... Yeah. Um, I'm sure you've had it. Yeah, I can't. I can't think of a of a whole lot. We had. Uh, I mean, we had an experience where. Um, Long, long story short, we were asked by a client to score something custom for a, a Microsoft. Um, Microsoft ad, and uh, through the process, they kind of drove us down a few different paths of, of composing, and we asked a lot of questions and did what we normally do. Um, at the end of it, they referenced um, they, re they referenced a song from a very popular film, um, a very popular indie film, award-winning indie film. Um, 
Beast of the Southern Wild is the name of the, the film. Yeah. Um, and so we uh, use that as a reference. And there's a lot of copyright uh, uh, laws and things involved. Um, and so um, in this case, we stayed. A, we, we did it in that vein, but did it a little bit different. Um, and we uh, didn't reach out to the to the you know we didn't try to contact the the, the original uh, creator. Anyways, um, what we didn't know is the agency actually had been pursuing the original creator of that, of that song, pursuing them pretty heavily, trying to license it, and they kept being told no, no, no. And we, didn't, we, we, we weren't privy to any of that information. Mm -hmm. So all we heard was, hey, they took us on all these different paths, and I think they were earnest in that, trying to find other options. At the end, they couldn't, they couldn't help but go back to the thing they loved. They had us do it. Of course, as soon as it went live, it went viral. Uh, I think it's at like 75 million views right now. It's called uh, Child of the '90s. It's a it's a it's a Microsoft Internet Explorer commercial. Not, not that I know of anyone that uses Internet Explorer anymore, but um, um, it was just a uh, so it went viral. We got sued. Um, now we have insurance for those sorts of things, and and we were totally unaware of it. And so um, you know, lawyer, we have insurance for that. Lawyers figured out. Ended up being uh, we ended up settling um, for a um, you know pretty modest amount. I think at the end of the day, but it was really stressful uh, when, we, when we got the call from Fox um, Searchlight Films saying, "Hey, uh, this seems like you ripped off our song." So um, that was really stressful. Um, but in the end, we navigated it well. We were able to maintain a relationship with the client still, with who we uh, really enjoy working with, and um, I don't think Microsoft thinks thinks too much of us, uh, you know, good or bad. So it's good. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, uh, here and then here. Also, after your journey and what you know of your co-workers, what do you think is the best like path towards getting into the creative industry, mm -hmm. like advertising or like your music? Yeah, that that's an easy one for me. Get in as early as you can. So um, uh, it might be harder in a smaller place like Ashland um, or in the in Southern Oregon, but. Um, Find opportunities to intern, find opportunities to work part-time, find opportunities to work on projects. Uh, the sooner you can start getting experience working with creatives, working in creative endeavors, even if it's in the, in the periphery, like, like not directly in creative, but just like interning, like, whatever you can do, like get experience now. Um, I didn't intern a whole lot as a, uh, as a, as a, as a college student. Um, and when I got out and moved up to Portland and started looking for those jobs I wanted, I realized I was really missing that, that valuable internship experience, the junior level experience. And companies would invite me to intern for them, but at that point they wanted me to do it you know, for, uh, without being paid. And after you leave college and move to the city and have rent to pay, that's the wrong time to be trying to do something unpaid. While you're in college, if there's any way you can figure it out, like find a way to take on an unpaid internship or a paid internship or anything you can find. Um, sometimes, sometimes you can negotiate a stipend for an internship, um, but get, get, get involved uh, as soon as you can. So in regards to your, cat the, your artist catalogs, mm -hmm. uh, you store them exclusively, right? They're all licensed to you? Or are they in coups with like other publishing companies where these artists can get licensing from you but also have contracts with other companies? Yeah, the, ma the majority of the artists that we represent are actually non-exclusive. Um, and that, that harkens back to my background starting managing bands in the beginning. As a band manager, I wanted as many irons in the fire, as many opportunities out there as I could have. Um, uh, and so we kind of maintain that, that same um, uh, philosophy in working with artists is we don't, um, we have a couple caveats to that. Uh, the artists we work with, we don't want them to be on a similar online uh, li licensing platform where people can shop prices. You know, our site and another site and another site. Because then I think it starts becoming about the price and not about the music. So we have a couple caveats to it, but mainly we're not exclusive with the artists we re represent because we want them to be able to pursue as many opportunities as they can. And so the artists then are, are basically paid on a per play basis for the that they get placed in, right? uh, yeah, on the on the licensing side, yeah, it's on a it's on a per per license basis. And on the c composing side, sometimes they'll get a, a small modest fee. It's called a demo fee to uh, basically come up with the idea for the for the project. Because sometimes they're competitive and we're c coming up with ideas, uh, custom composed ideas, and so is our other people. So when it's competitive, sometimes there's a it's called a demo fee. Um, it's usually a hundred to two hundred dollars to for them to get working, and that's just up front. And then if they win the job, then there's a uh, uh, payment in addition to that. Okay, so then you got, your your profits are generated from the con like a contractual basis, mm -hmm. or do you also get revenues from the per play license? Typically, uh, I would say the vast majority, 95% of, of what we earn is, uh, is uh, just on a, a split uh, with, the, with the artists on whatever the license fee is. Um, there are occasions where there are some uh, royalties 
uh, through a, a performing rights organization or maybe through a Screen Actors Guild or something like that where people at Marmoset that are involved in the project, maybe they have their voice on something or they're producing on something or they're playing on something, they may get some uh, residual royalties on that, but more often than not that all goes to the artists and we just give us a piece of the actual fee. Okay. Well, since it's after six, after six, yeah. Um, I'm sure that Ryan would be glad to talk, you know, spend a few minutes if there's anybody that got some follow-up um, questions. But thank you all for attending, and um, that's it for tonight. Thank you. Thank you.